Well, I'm going to uh, get us started while you're all uh, getting settled and enjoying your pizza. Please feel free to help yourself, but not too much because we're about a beastly profession. So. Oh. <laughs> okay. um, this is one of our series presented by the Tulane Prevention Research Center at the university, and we are one of 37 centers financed by the Centers for Disease Control Prevention that focus on active living and healthy eating. Um, we do this work through policy and environmental change. Um, so look out for us. We've got a lot of seminars coming up in the spring. You might see some notices in the elevator. So um, think about those as you're thinking about your spring schedule. We also have a sign sheet and evaluation form, and there's a PowerPoint presentation at the front, so please take that. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our speakers today. Um, well, first, uh, I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm Kate Parker. I'm the assistant director for the center um, and also director for the Kids Walk Coalition. But with me today is Jennifer Woolley and Matt Rufo. Jennifer is a pedestrian and bicycle engineer employed by the Louisiana Public Health Institute on loan to the city of New Orleans with generous support from the Energy Foundation. Um, corporation. Corporation. <laughs> Jennifer has provided technical support and guidance to improve the city's capacity to expand facilities for biking and walking. Um, she's really helped work on a complete streets policy for the city along with Matt and also has introduced new opportunities for physical activities such as a ciclovia or a ciclanola as we like to call it in New Orleans and hopefully a, a Mardi Gras, a ciclogras. So you'll, she's going to talk a little bit about some of those programming ideas in her presentation. Uh, Jennifer received her bachelor's in science and engineering from Louisiana State University and her master's in civil engineering from Louisiana State University as well. She also has professional licensure in um, engineering. Matt Rufo is a bicycle and pedestrian transportation planner and serves as program manager for the Kids Walk Coalition, a partnership of local public health, transportation, and community advocates led by us at the Tulane PRC, committed to reducing childhood obesity by providing safe and walkable environments for children and families. Um, Matt spends half of his time with Jennifer at the Department of Public Works and half of his time here at the PRC with me. Um, he provides direct support to the city's transportation engineers on pedestrian and bicycling projects, as well as helping to um, work on a complete streets ordinance for the city of New Orleans. Matt uh, has a Bachelor of Arts from Brown in Urban Studies and a Master's in City Planning from the University of Pennsylvania. Today, Matt and Jennifer are going to discuss how to determine walkability and bikeability in neighborhoods, how to assess environments for active living, and some strategies to make neighborhoods healthier for physical activity. So please join me in welcoming Matt and Jennifer. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Kate. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Matt Rufo, uh, and I work with the Prevention Research Center. And uh, we're really excited to talk about our work today uh, and uh, speak before you. So I'm just going to go through the uh, outline of what we're going to talk about. Um, just do, we'll just introduce our work and uh, talk about um, factors that determine walkability and bikeability. What is it out there about the built environment that makes it easier for people to walk in their communities to bicycle? Uh, and then we'll look at what are different ways to measure that walkability and that bikeability. The bikeability, this is something that a lot of um, different researchers out there have been working on trying to come up with good tools for assessing and evaluating our environments. Uh, and then talk about what kind of policies, uh, designs, engineering, uh, what kind of planning can you do to really try to make improvements to uh, your built environment? And then we'll uh, move on to take questions. Um, Jennifer, do you want to talk more? Just introduce yourself. And I think about? Kate did a great okay. introduction. Um, uh, so there it is on the screen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and throughout the course of this, we'll, we'll talk more about uh, the specific work we do. But I'm a city planner by training, um, and I joined the um, Venture Resource Center last year to work on the Healthy Communities, Healthy Kids, Healthy Communities grant, which is a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation supported initiative. They support 50 different communities around the country with this grant. New Orleans is just one of them. And it's a grant that runs from 2010 through 2013. So it's a little four year program to really put together a partnership of local advocacy and community organizations with a focus on transportation and public health. So what do we do as part of our work? Well, um, we're both work on loan to the Department of Public Works. Uh, not really, a, sort of like consultants or technical advisors. The city doesn't uh, 
compensate us directly. We're funded by grants, and this is an interesting model, I think, where in, instead of working um, outside the city trying to get people's attention or trying to uh, really just advocate for improvements, they're actually partnering with the city to work within their office. So I've got a desk at City Hall, I've got a press desk at City Hall, and um, it really is a great opportunity to kind of work one-on-one -on -one with engineers there and policymakers. And we focus on uh, pedestrian improvements, bicycle improvements, safe routes to school programs, helping schools apply for uh, these infrastructure grants, and also working on ADA accessibility issues. Uh, and as I mentioned, that partnership element of it, uh, we're not just doing technical work within the department, we're really trying to do outreach to different uh, partner organizations, including uh, advocacy groups like Bike Easy or AARP, uh, which has a really strong focus on making neighborhoods more walkable, uh, but also other government agencies, the Regional Transit Authority, which runs the buses and streetcars here, uh, the Regional Planning Commission, uh, which administers federal funding for transportation projects. They have a bicycle pedestrian coordinator that we work closely with. Um, who else here? The State Department of Transportation, uh, and other public health organizations like Louisiana Public Health Institute, and neighborhood groups like Neighborhood Partnership Network. Uh, and outside of, aside from actual technical like pet projects, we're working on trying to create broader policies the city can adopt, such as a complete streets policy, which would prioritize, uh, or at least make the city consider bicycle and pedestrians uh, when re uh, redeveloping streets uh, and other public events, such as Sydney, which we can talk more about. And so this is just a sampling of some of our members within um, the Kids Walk Coalition. I don't know if any of these are, are very familiar to you, but Friends of the Corridor, uh, is a friends of the group for the corridor. Uh, we've got some uh, organizations that are invested in schools, there's communities and schools, um, city year as well, and uh, of course some of our government partners, Department of Public Works, Regional Planning Commission. So, the built environment, you know, that's kind of a wonky term, but what are we talking about? We're talking about the physical landscape, and over the last since World War II, the United States has really developed into an automobile-dependent uh, culture, uh, environment as well. And these are just some glimpses uh, of what that looks like. Um, parking lots, um, roads such as this, which you see in New Orleans, Veterans Boulevard, uh, Shugman's Road to a lesser extent, but you find these kind of landscapes in basically any city around the country. Um, Nearside highways uh, that sometimes create very hospitable places for pedestrians underneath and these sprawling communities, which are separated by use, meaning that residential's over here, commercial's over there, you work over here, and the only way to get to between them is basically driving your car, or if you don't have a car, to walk, or to wait for a bus for a very long time uh, to get to those places. Um, so these are just some glimpses uh, locally of what makes a more walkable environment. Um, I don't know if any of these are familiar to anyone. Does anyone know where some of these photos are taken? Oak Street, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the Pitts family, the Pitcholi family, uh, walking through the French Quarter. We got some local, you know, famous pedestrians. Uh, this one's taking near uh, Audubon Park down here, and this is from a walk to school day event that uh, was held at um, on St. Cloud Avenue at Drew Elementary. And, uh, yeah, so New Orleans does a pretty good job of it has really good bones, is what people say, for walkability. We've got a really compact street network, uh, historic, you know, um, low, low, sorry, well preserved sort of fabric, and so it's generally interesting to walk around with a mix of uses in a lot of neighborhoods. But let's get really into some more details about what technically makes a place really walkable. Um, first and foremost, sidewalks, um, or where there's no sidewalks, at least shoulders, as you see in this upper left corner, in more rural areas. Uh, even if you don't have a sidewalk, you can still accommodate pedestrians by having a wide shoulder. But in denser, more populated areas, you got to have a sidewalk. And so when you're looking at a sidewalk, you want to make sure that it's wide enough. You know, we recommend at least five feet. Uh, the sidewalk here is on St. Claude and, not St. Claude, Rampart in Esplanade. There's a new housing development there. Really nice and wide, really smooth, good um, surface there. It's got a buffer, which is how we describe uh, trees and furniture between the vehicle lane and the sidewalk itself. It's got a good curb there. It's not one of these curbs that just kind of transitions so you can just drive onto the sidewalk and the street. Um, and it's not obstructed. You don't have to worry about um, tripping over something or walking into a hole. Great 
create a sidewalk. Um, in addition to sidewalks, you want to make sure that they're uh, accessible, uh, meaning that if you're uh, an individual with a disability, if you have a hearing, if you have uh, a visual impairment, or if you're in a wheelchair, um, if you're pushing a grocery cart, if you're pushing your kids in a stroller, um, these are issues that affect families, so whether they have elderly um, members of the family or kids pushing around. Um, and so uh, you want to have programs, you want to have um, uh, accessible push buttons uh, to activate pedestrian signals. Um, we don't have a lot of that in our lines often. If you have a pedestrian signal, it'll um, go on. What's that? Don't we have zero? <laughs> we have zero push buttons. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we don't really have too many, do we? There's some. There's some, but generally you'll get a pedestrian signal without having to press a button uh, at the signal message where we, don't have, where we do have them. Signage, you want to make sure that it's it's clear and easy to read and in good shape. You know, this little one here, this middle one was taken I think in the uh, Carrollton or Holly Grove area near our school, just completely bleached out. Much better condition sign here. With, yeah, if you have flashing beacons, even better. And not just signage for uh, automobilists, but also for people trying to find their way around on foot. That's a great way wayfinding sign. Um, we get Cooper actually uh, showing you know which way is what in the map to help orient pedestrians. Intersection crossings, we want to make sure that this one can cross an intersection very safely. You can do that by having high visibility crosswalks, such so as here at Carrollton and Oak Street, or pedestrian refuge islands. Um, this is a national example. Um, and, uh, you know, this isn't even very wide street. If you do have a wide street, you really want to have a, a refuge like that. You know, street widths will make a huge difference in terms of being able to cross safely. Uh, this is an example that we do want to avoid here. That appears to be um, four vehicle lanes in one direction with two turn lanes, and in the other direction, another four vehicle lanes, and with barely a refuge there. It does have a sidewalk. It does have a sidewalk, yes. The length across the street is like the length of the block. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> 100 feet there at least. <laughs> uh, so that's a situation that we want to avoid if you're in the street. And uh, we'll talk about road diets as well, ways to turn those down. Uh, driver behavior impacts walkability. Um, again, you want to make sure that <laughs> you're enforcing the law. Um, you want to avoid allowing cars to park on the sidewalk. That's actually a police car from yeah. cars. Um, so that's, that's a little example. Here's a much better example. Um, that's from Europe on the lower left. That's um, cars stopping before the stop bar at the crosswalk, so in a high volume traffic uh, intersection. Pedestrians have a way to you know, cross the street and not cause a lot of congestion by having to walk behind cars because the cars are parked in the crosswalk. Um, and it's a law in Louisiana now to stop at, um, at crosswalks so the passengers crossing here and not to do something like this where someone's cutting off the pedestrian. All right. In addition to those technical requirements and, and, and Law enforcement, you want to make it you know, fun, or not, at least, not fun, at least comfortable and interesting for someone to walk through. Um, shade is really important. You want to have, um, again, a clear uh, space for people to walk and a space for people to rest. Uh, and in terms of safety, you got to have pedestrian street lighting. And those cobra lights that are for vehicles on streets that light up the street, they're great, but um, if it leaves the sidewalk dark, then you'll be more likely to walk in the middle of the street, which you see a lot of the Outside of the public right-of-way, when I say public right-of-way, I'm talking about the street itself and the sidewalks, but this is more privately, kind of a more privately owned area. Um, so this is where land use and zoning comes into play, and land use is whether it's used for residential or commercial. A walkable environment tends to be one that has a mix of uses so that um, you can walk from your home to a corner store or to a supermarket or to a bus stop uh, or to your office. Um, you want to have architecture that um, goes up to the actual, that's pedestrian oriented and that comes up to the sidewalk, uh, which you see on Oak Street. Uh, this is an example in Virginia, this is an example in Philadelphia. But these articulate facades just make the environment a little bit more interesting than just a blank wall, uh, such as this right here in a parking lot, which is banal spaces that don't offer um, a lot for person walking for leisure, or the person walking for physical activity, or the person walking to actually go out and do things. And they're extremely 
extremely hot during the summer, especially in the Yeah. Uh, and final, yeah, um, you want to have a lot of transportation options. It's much easier to live without a car if you have a number of different ways of getting around. And so that means riding your bike, taking a streetcar, walking out to a bus stop, or even using uh, this is in Philadelphia, uh, car share. You know, that, as someone who's lived in car share suites before, I say it opens up a whole new world of opportunity. If you don't have a car, you don't want to own a car, but you do need a car sometimes to get out to you. Park at IKEA, wherever I have you, and uh, so uh, you want to have a, what we call multi-model, multi-modal connectivity. So a variety of options. Yeah, question. Sorry, I was just wondering where the other one, like that one's from. The lower left. Yeah. That's Madison, yeah, Wisconsin. Madison. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people on bikes there. So anyway, that's just a summary of what makes a, an area more walkable, and Jennifer's going to talk more about what makes areas bikeable. Is that correct? Yeah, you can see your appearance there. He's everywhere, man. <laughs> Little cameos from that. Um, okay, I'm going to read from my nose, I apologize. Um, so what makes the environment bikeable? I've been doing this for the past seven years and assessing New Orleans for bikeability. Um, we use the term walkability, bikeability, which, which kind of indicates to you, um, you know, can you do it? However, it doesn't indicate necessarily bike friendliness or walk friendliness, which I, I kind of look at as two different things. So, um, to look at you know bikeability, um, we're, we're talking about things like uh, the quality of the space that you have for operation, um, uh, how wide is it, this sort of thing, uh, quality of the network, um, the density of of your connections, the connectivity of the network, and also um, things like the, the quality of the environment, uh, motorist aggression, um, yielding, speeding, things like that. And so what I wanted to kind of go into is a little bit of how the built environment can be assessed for, for these types of factors, looking at the quality of that operating space for the bicyclist. Um, so, we talked about space, proximity of the, the, the bicyclist to motor vehicles. Um, how many are how many people are ride your bikes on um, the streets of New Orleans? Okay. So you know that you know feeling uh, a level of comfort, um, giving some space between you and that that moving vehicle um, improves your comfort level drastically. Also, the speed of traffic is another major factor. Um, how heavy is the traffic on that roadway? Um, heavy vehicles like buses and, and trucks that are present. And of course, we know this very well in New Orleans pavement condition. It's a, a primary indicator as to how a cyclist will choose a route um, in getting from uh, getting to their destination. Um, so looking at how this translates, once you kind of know what you're, what you're looking at, how does this translate into possible strategies for improving that environment? Um, the strategies, there are essentially five categories of, of strategies. Um, design or engineering, uh, things like how, how do we approach the um, uh, designing that space for, for the operation of, of that, that mode. Um, oftentimes we find streets that aren't even, have, have not even considered um, the pedestrian mode or the bicycle mode. Um, so if they're very motor, motor, motor vehicle oriented, it makes it harder for a bicycle or a pedestrian to operate there. Things like design guidelines can improve that, can improve how um, streets are designed to better accommodate um, all modes. Um, and also having people uh, who are making the decisions skilled, like having the skill set to um, properly address the challenges at play. Um, it's, it's um, always surprises me how little exposure engineers get to the design of bicycle and pedestrian facilities during their formal training. Um, so what we try to do is to um, offer opportunities for the people who come in contact with those problems day to day to have um, the technical expertise to deal with them. Um, also planning. Uh, Matt mentioned a few, a few um, items like like uh, land use and um, 
zoning and things like that. Um, we have, you know, master, most cities have, most large cities have master plans. Um, most large cities have zoning, not all cities have zoning. Um, and then, uh, you know, how we're programming transportation funding for improvements. Um, so these are, these are, you know, kind of how we get at the, the, um, the connections within that, uh, that space that the bike's supposed to be using. This is also going back to strategies for improving walking environments. So this is bike and pet. Um, policy is a really important area to, um, that you can't ignore. Uh, you can work in frustration if you only deal with the built environment and you never get better policies that can help to clear up a lot of the matters um, uh, in, in a larger way. So things like complete streets, you may have heard of complete streets policies before. It's a very, um, uh, it's sort of a more American focused uh, kind of policy intervention. It goes by the, the name complete streets because it's about completing the streets for all modes. Let's not just look at an automobile oriented roadway. Let's complete the sidewalks, let's complete bike lanes, things like that. So routine accommodation of, of all users. Um, looking at how these facilities are maintained, or if they're maintained at all. Um, Matt mentioned lighting, for example. Lighting is enough, you have know, gotta maintain it. So um, looking at how these things are prioritized, and that gets down to the funding um, of, of where, how this, how these kind of improvements, whether it be capital or, or maintenance, um, are viewed in overall funding schemes for municipalities and states. Um, so the last two areas are education and encouragement. Um, you may have seen this campaign around town, which was targeted toward um, motorists to respect pedestrians and crosswalks. Um, there have been two campaigns. Uh, one has focused on bicyclists, um, both targeting motorists and bicyclists um, for for um, improving bicycle safety, knowing the, the laws. Um, so obviously this, and I, during my time in, in public health, I've, I've learned about these campaigns and how, you know, uh, this is definitely not a pedestrian oriented sign, <laughs> but it gets to the targeted audience, the, the motorists. Um, so the pedestrian signs would be like on, on uh, transit shelters, things along those lines. But targeted campaigns looking at the full picture, looking at the motorists, the pedestrians, the bicyclists, and everything in between. Um, driver training could be an important tool. Uh, training of law enforcement, you know, making sure that the law enforcement know what the laws are so that there's not any, um, so that they can properly enforce um, across all modes. Um, public service announcements, of course, are. Um, Safe Routes to School is a federal program that funds not only infrastructure improvements around schools, but also education, safety training, that sort of thing um, for, for schools. And then community events, just getting the word out and raising the profile of um, bicycling and pedestrian safety. Enforcement, things like um, speeding, other kind of traffic violations. Um, Parking, Matt showed a really good example of parking on a sidewalk, you know. Um, so these are just, you know, kind of get to the, the uh, not things that get outside of the built environment, they're sort of the non-tangible kind of aspects, the, the environmental aspects that I, I discussed um, that go into creating a more bike-friendly, bikeable, and walkable environment. So when we're looking at um, auditing the environment, how do you, um, you know, there's, there's different types of audits that can be used. Depends on who's using them and who the intended audience is and what you're trying to do with the, with the audits. So um, you have, typically you'll have audits that are, that are set up for like community advocates, people who want to advocate for things like, you know, um, uh, you know I want, better sidewalks in my community, or I want uh, to slow traffic down in my community, or this kind of thing. And, um, and these are mostly community advocate-oriented 
Then you have the kind of, on the other end of the spectrum that are geared toward professionals in planning and engineering, engineering and public health. Um, and so then there's that in between where you don't have a set um, type of survey that 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 does exactly what you need. And um, Matt will give a good example of how um, he created his own survey to address the specific issues he was looking at. So an example of um, audit tools for community advocates, um, they're usually qualitative, um, not very technical, pretty easy to use. Um, the Pedestrian and Bike Information Center, PBIC, has, has for many years had um, a, a really great tool for walking audits and for bike, bicycling audits um, that you can get on these websites. Um, but they look at not just the physical environment, but they look at other sort of environmental issues like, you know, uh, uh, speeding, how do the drivers behave, was your walk pleasant, things like this. Um, really geared toward people who maybe don't think about these kind of things all the time. And, uh, but can help them to advocate for better, better um, environments. Then you get into, um, like I said, the other end of the spectrum, um, professionals. Um, these are primarily used by planners and engineers. The highway passing man manual is um, an example of a, a, uh, a tool that um, is routinely used in traffic studies to assess the, um, the level of service for the, the vehicles or the, the user that are operating in that space. And the um, level of service is a term that LOS is a term that engineers throw around a lot, um, but it essentially just measures the function of the, the road facility for specific user types. Um, in 2010, the Highway Capacity Manual was revised um, in a major way because for the first time ever there was there were new tools available for the analysis of intermodal multimodal interactions which really in the bike and pet advocacy world was like a tremendous step forward because we you know the level of service was originally oriented toward freeways how fast can cars go and unimpeded and so level of service is generally thought of as A to F a being best, that being worse. Um, and so that level of service didn't, we had to kind of change, it was more nuanced when you start talking about the pedestrian environment and the, the bicycle environment, because obviously a crowded sidewalk isn't necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> crowded freeway is maybe a bad thing, but um, so this this is now a new tool that we can use as planners and engineers, and, um, and I'll show you an example of how, how it's used. Also, recently, um, the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, ASHTO, um, released the Highway Safety Manual. And this provides an analysis tool for predicting crashes on certain types of roadways and um, how you can effectively reduce crash frequencies in those roadways. Right. So going back to the slide where, where we talked about um, common factors that affect cycles. Um, the, the major issues around space and speed of traffic, volume, things like that. I want to show an example of how the level of service analysis would characterize different spaces. So when you're talking to an engineer, they'll understand this. Um, it's, it's kind of the, the language that they speak. So this kind of gives you an idea of how this, this translates. These are two different facilities I'm going to show you, but they're very similar in how they're um, configured. So here you have a, um, an example of this poor guy who's, <laughs> I'm surprised he even has a shoulder because a lot of our guys don't even have, have those in some of the rural areas. But you know, he's very confined, no shoulder, you've got um, relatively narrow travel lanes, two-way um, highway kind of situation, um, uh, the speed limit is, is set, it's pretty high for a roadway that's that narrow. and. Uh, and uh, you know you have a, a low to moderate volume, I'd say moderate volume of, of, um, of vehicles, and then some percent truck, uh, trucks. So this would be rated as a bicycle level of service, which is not good. It's better than an F, but 
Not good. All right, so next, I just can't wait till this uh, the rest of the results <laughs> comes by. Now, like. What's, uh, what's yeah. ADT? This is um, the average daily, uh, average daily traffic. So it's kind of a volume that um, you'll see used very often in engineering studies. That's when you see the cables thrown out uh, across the road. That's what they're doing, they're counting the cables. So this is a similar type of facility, but the, what's the major difference? The guy has a, a, a space to operate. So really, not a lot changed. The, redu the speed was reduced slightly, and actually these should be um, um, using the posted speed as a as an indicator as to how motorists actually drive is, is probably a weak indicator, so actual speeds. Um, would be a better indicator. But um, essentially, same space for automobiles, but wider space for, for bicyclists, and, and um, it, almost twice the volume on this roadway as, as the other one, but the same percentage of heavy vehicles. And this drastically improves the conditions according to the um, level of service analysis. <laughs> so um, the other tool that I mentioned was a highway safety manual um, that helps to predict crush rates, and it's a very sophisticated tool. Um, but essentially, what we're, what this, this is an example of um, a before condition. So you have like a traditional four lane uh, highway, and you want to look at making some improvements to see if you can reduce uh, or improve safety for, across all modes. So this just gives you some traffic volumes, um, speed, speed limits, uh, pavement conditions. So what we're doing is this. This is this could be ca categorized as a road diet, if you know that term. <laughs> it's kind of thrown around. It's kind of cute, but uh, a road diet generally refers to like bike bike head folks and, and engineers, uh, which can be the same thing. Um, is the reduction in travel lanes? So we reduce this from four to two. Have a turning lane and have a bike lane at it. So how are we affecting, we're not affecting the road space, but how does this affect crash rates? So the, the um, site so manual looks at things called crash modification factors, and it matches that with predictive tools, predicting um, based on lots and lots of research, um, the, the crash frequency for certain types of configuration. So um, here we see that the the estimated reduction in crashes is up to 32%. That could be realized by just making that change to the roadway, that road diet configuration. And that's across all modes. Um, so then you can then you know, estimate future crashes, um, you know, annual crashes. And so bike, head, and cars reduction. Yeah. And I've heard some of these from a recent training at Regional Planning Commission put on, um, Kittleson helped with. So, um, it's a really kind of depiction of, of, as to the usefulness of, of these kind of tools. And um, this kind of information can then just, can be then uh, used to um, present to decision makers to say, this is worth the investment, look at how many lives can be saved or um, damages can, can be saved and um, get their attention. Um, what's the, the saying, what gets measured gets, gets uh, Managed something to look like. Um, so I think that's that's all I'm going to do on this tool. So that kind of gives you a, a, a range of, of uh, assessment tools. So Matt's going to talk about one that he developed for school zones. Sure. So uh, we worked together to come up with a tool of our own for doing assessment of school areas throughout New Orleans. You know, given our relationship with Public Works, there were actually some a few a handful of really concrete things we could do with audit data. And so we wanted to make sure that um, we collected the data that would be most relevant to, or have the most use, really. You know, we could go out and count all the number of parking lots out there, or um, you know, where lighting is, or where lighting isn't. Or we could um, collect just information that we knew that we had the power to actually uh, make some changes with, given our, our embedded status there. And so we went around and collected information from each of the different uh, elementary and uh, middle schools out there, each of the public uh, ones, and there are about 63 campuses out there, and we did a one-block survey around, uh, one-block radius survey around each of those schools 
the total of over 170 linear miles of sidewalk that we surveyed. And so, uh, go to the next slide, we can look at um, a page from our, our own uh, audit guide tool. We looked at four different things, sidewalk conditions, signage, crosswalks, and curb ramps. And this is just a page out of our guide um, where we came up with a methodology for evaluating sidewalks. I had some photos of what constitutes uh, a good sidewalk, what constitutes one that's fair, and one uh, what constitutes poor condition or missing altogether. And if you go to the next slide, we'll see uh, what that did look like uh, in the end. And so this is a uh, base map that we sent uh, team to trade surveyors out with. And to mark up with notes, this is, in, this is a translation of field notes into something a lot more legible. But it gives us a good um, image, of a good snapshot of what the conditions are there at, at this given moment. And uh, explain the, all the G's and the F's and what that symbolizes. Right. So um, they basically looked at a 10 to 15 foot stretch of sidewalk, um, or segment along every sidewalk. And so every letter represents um, the conditions there. So a bunch of G's are here, really good condition. Um, other areas are not so good, a lot of and views around here. Uh, these symbols represent curb ramps in good condition, or a missing curb ramp, or a missing curb ramp or good condition. And so this is good uh, for a number of different uh, purposes. One is if you actually, if the school is about to start and you realize that there's a very important sign missing, with a different map for signage across walks. But if you just look at it and say, okay, here are all the different areas, around the school to make improvements. Uh, if you want to help a school apply for a state process to school grant, uh, we've got this information. We'd like to um, work with schools to kind of do this type of exercise together to help identify the uh, problems in their neighborhood and to get a comprehensive look at it. Matt, can you point out where the school is in this? Yeah, so we did a one block race around the very school. So the school's on this block right here. Uh, and we decided to go an extra block uh, in that direction for this one because the major road is right there. Uh, that's the Pullman Avenue, where you're more likely to find a uh, school zone sign. You generally only find them on roads that are 30, mile per, 30 miles per hour or more. There's not much sense in putting a 20 mile per hour zone in a street that's already 25 miles per hour. And we tabulated all that information. We you know, determined percentages of sidewalks in bad condition around schools by adding up all the G's or the P's and the F's, dividing it by the P's by that number. Um, and we did a similar exercise for signage and for crosswalks and curb ramps and came up with these scores. And you can see that based on our um, scoring methodology here that most schools ranked either in hazardous or substandard condition with only a small handful and uh, acceptable condition only one school over in South Carrollton Avenue, which is actually in good shape. Some work was done there recently. There's great sidewalks and ramps and uh, roadway surface there. When did you do the field work? And this was done last summer, summer or fall of 2010. Some snapshots from that survey, uh, examples of a missing sidewalk, and an example of a really good crosswalk uh, and sidewalk right here uh, on South Carolina and down the right. And this is over on 74 um, here at Down 35. It looks like a sidewalk was never built there in the first place. There's some neighborhoods, like in the back of town, you know, on the other side uh, from the river, or the lake side of. Uh, Claiborne, St. Cloud Avenue, um, that has never really had those facilities put in the first place. Looking at traffic control, like the same thing with uh, signage and crosswalks, lack of maintenance often mm -hmm. is the reason for conditions ending this way. You know, we've also done a good job of uh, putting some of these facilities in the first place, but after they've been installed, actually keeping them up uh, in good shape is, uh, can be a challenge, which is why we often uh, encourage crosswalks such as these, these continentals, what we call them, where the actual vehicle tires can go uh, on the, if you line them up right, the vehicle tires will go right on the pavement, and now we're down the striping there. And you want more examples of good signs like this. You can have that short foot. There you go. Um, and we have, oh, I can go run and get a bunch of copies of the report we came out with earlier this year that um, summarizes our findings. Uh, it's called Stepping to School, and it includes a number of our different policy recommendations as well. So it's on our website, too. Um, so that's looks at our audit, and uh, Jennifer, let's wrap up by 
us what more the activities we're doing? Yeah, so I just want to kind of um, wrap up by telling you a little bit about what we're currently working on here in New Orleans. And um, going back to infrastructure, which we're most known for, <laughs> um, is that we've created, uh, we're working on getting to 50 this year, but we're up to 44 miles of designated bikeways in the city. Um, when I first came to New Orleans in 2004, we had like seven. So we've made significant progress. And uh, we're increasing our bike parking, designated bike parking um, facilities. Also looking at target pedestrian safety and um, accessibility projects uh, according to the Americans, uh, the American Disabilities Act. Um, Recently, we're, we looked at, uh, we're, we're developing a plan to address accessibility throughout the city to prioritize where improvements should go, and that's been working on that, which means that um, things like curb ramps will then, um, you know, we'll be able to facilitate some decision making that targets where the highest needs are. Um, school zone improvements, we've looked at using uh, the audit tool that Matt um, helped to develop to help um, identify where those issues are and looking at urgent issues versus things that we can um, look at for, say, San Francisco school grants. Um, policy initiatives, I mentioned Complete Streets. Um, currently, there is a Complete Streets ordinance that should be introduced very, very soon by City Council. Um, so that, that will, we will gain significant, um, uh, it will be a significant improvement upon the, uh, you know, to, to people who are advocating for these types of facilities uh, and um, working on some street design guidelines and you know other things like uh, bicycle friendly um, uh, the League of America bicyclists does a bicycle friendly communities sort of um, program and so it looks at a number of different types of not just facilities but all those other factors that I mentioned earlier and we're currently at bronze level, which we just achieved this year. Yeah. Um, and so we're hoping to get to you know the next level, the next level, uh, ultimately platinum, possibly. And then um, there's a similar type of community application for walk friendliness. And so this helps to not just it's not just a matter of like, hey, look at us, we, we, we're doing well. It's it's also a way of informing discussions and um, and policies that can help us get to that next level. Uh, we're looking at the master plan that was recently um, finalized at the city, um, and now the comprehensive zoning ordinance is being um, retooled. We're looking at opportunities there, as well as uh, evaluation. You've probably heard of some, some of Kate and Jeanette's um, uh, observations, and around maybe you participated in some of them, counting uh, how many people are actually using the facilities before versus after. Um, and then activities, we mentioned SQL VIA, um, for, for, you, for those of you who may not know what SQL VIA is, it's uh, literally translates into bike path in Spanish, but it is um, generally, uh, you know, sort of a closing down of streets to automobiles one day a week, usually on a Sunday, or you reprogram the space for physical activity. So dancing, bicycling, um, skating, things like this. Um, so it really kind of changes that whole environment and gives people a, a, you know, a reason to get out there and be active. Um, and these are spread across the, uh, the Americas and, in, and there's um, quite a few in North America at this point. They go by different names, Summer Streets, Sunday Parkways. Um, so we're really kind of doing something like that here. There's also things like International Watch School Day where we actually get kids out walking and um, give them Blooms and things like that to say, yeah, walking's a good thing, it's a good way of integrating physical activity into your day. So that's it's just a snapshot of some of the stuff that we're working on. We've got a lot more to do. But um, I think that if I think that's it for our presentation. And if you have any questions, please ask. Are bike ways and bike corridors the same as far as portable lines go? I know some roads are designated as bike corridors, and some are like have designated lanes. I'm wondering yeah. like, what bikeways. Yeah, I do it. So bikeways, I define bikeways as having some sort of official designation, whether that be for signage, pavement markings, or a combination. So it could include bike lanes, trails, shared bikeways, 
Um, generally, that's how others categorize. But there's been some concerted effort to improve that corridor of four bikes, is what how I characterize bikeways, defined bikeways. Some years ago, I stopped at the scene of an accident and controlled young cyclists that had been put on a car. He goes across the Broadway median into the path of an on car. Well, he was injured. He lost a ear, had some facial things, he had pelvic fracture, and all the rest of stuff. But the news people got there as I was attending to him and then the ambulance. And they had a big thing about bicycle safety after. And they made a point on their WWL presentations that supposedly there is a law that states. You are not supposed to be opening a car door without gingerly checking to make sure no one is coming. And I don't know if you know of any law like that that does exist, but that was the point that they were saying that you know you really should be getting out on the sidewalks, not on the bike side. Yeah. And I and I congratulate you on it because I think it's wonderful. Now I've seen these bike paths, but I see streets, and you mentioned South Carrollton Avenue and I think the Palmer Park area in the morning where the carpool is lined up and there is a bike path. They're like, one wonders how safe are they really if somebody trying to get to work when you've got that kind of competition. Carpooling or, or like, are you talking about like, well, just the proximity the of the bike path mm -hmm. to where the vehicles are or may actually be parked. Right, you know, exactly. Yeah, you have a similar thing? I was just, yeah, I was kind of about, like, uh, my question was going to be, it goes, like, traffic lane, bike lane, off-street parking, and that's when you get these issues getting doored and things like that, and I haven't luckily had anything like that, but uh, you do have to, like, swerve sometimes, you slow down, it, like, is there anything that's, like, maybe traffic, off-street parking, bike lane? Is that in any type of, um, where people... Have, have that. There are a number of different formulas that, that yeah. can be used. It's all a matter of how much space you have to use. Right. So there, that's where the challenge comes in, especially when you're doing a retrofit. Uh -huh. um, so where there's the will and and there there you know where you can show that you won't cause other types of problems. Definitely, there are ways that you can rearrange. And um, you know, I've been doored on the right hand side right. too. So there, it's not that it's necessarily solved the problem. However, um, by putting a buffer in there that would allow the bicyclists to operate outside of that door zone is really where we're trying to go with, with these facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and so looking at, that's what this, the bike and chevron marking that you see on some shared roadways, that's a, a, a relatively new type of um, mechanism or uh, improvement that can be added because most of us growing up, bike routes were just, just had a sign, if that, you know, that you were, we were just informed that that was a, a, a space where bicyclists prefer to, to ride based on a science of bike route. and doesn't really tell you anything else. The bike and chevron markings on the ground help to indicate to motorists that, hey, a bicyclist might be in the space, but also gives a, 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 a bicyclist the information of if I, if I operate over this marking, I will be outside of the door zone. And that's really where it was to do. But the challenges of um, how that space is used after it after it's uh, implemented are always always a challenge. Um, so what we try to do is make sure that it, it makes logical sense and that we're maximizing the space for the most vulnerable users. And that um, you know where we can, where we're we pushing that vehicle over as far as we can, limiting the parking as much as we can, and getting that that uh, that bicyclist out of the, the door zone. But I mean, the same situation. If a car would have come, and it would have, been, we hear about these situations when it's a bicyclist is very vulnerable, you know, being endured. But even a car, you know, um, it's the same sort of liability kind of issue there, regardless of it's um, a car, someone opening on a bike versus a car. It's still supposed to check, right? Yeah, it's supposed to check. Uh, this is, I think, all the time that we have. 
for questions right now, but please um, grab Matt and Jennifer on your way out if you have additional questions, and um, please make sure to sign in and look for our future seminars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys.